Hi, and welcome back to our evolution unit. Here in this video, we're going to talk about evolutionary forces. This happy looking fellow is a male stalk eyed fly. I bet you can understand how he got his name. The eyes of male stalk eyed flies develop at the end of long stalks that extend out from their head. For a long time, this was somewhat puzzling as to why stalk eyed flies would have these eyes off on the end of these long sticks. But for reasons that should be made clear over the course of this video, we can start to understand how evolution could drive the development of such an odd phenotype. The question that we're going to look to answer here in this video is what causes or what is driving evolution in a population? We've already learned that evolution is defined as a change in allele frequencies over time. And one thing that we haven't explicitly discussed up to now is that that definition allows for other forces other than just natural selection to work to drive the evolution of a population. That's what we're going to talk about in this video. We'll review natural selection briefly. We'll talk about a mode of evolution known as sexual selection. We'll then talk about genetic drift and then gene flow. These are the four evolutionary forces that you need to be familiar with over your time in the course. So we'll go in and we'll look at each one in detail so that you have an understanding of what they all are and how they all function to drive the evolution of a population. Natural selection is probably best thought of for the purpose of this conversation as non-random and adaptive changes. What we mean by this is that natural selection is not driving random changes in the allele frequencies of the population. Instead, it's pushing the population to become increasingly adapted for its environment from generation to generation. We've talked about natural selection almost exclusively to this point. If you need more information about natural selection, I really encourage you to go back and review some of the prior videos on the subject for more details. It's a big deal, but we're not going to focus on it for the purpose of this video. Somewhat related to natural selection is this idea of sexual selection, which is also non-random. Sexual selection is adaptive, but it's reproductively adaptive. What we mean by this is that any trait that enables the members of that population to reproduce is something that is going to be favored through sexual selection. And of course, the traits that enable an individual to reproduce may in fact be maladaptive for the survival of that individual. Our mascot for sexual selection here is the peacock. Peacocks are males of their species that have an ornate and elaborate tail feather arrangement, which is beautiful to look at, but is a real pain in the butt for the male peacock as it slows them down, makes it hard for them to fly around, and generally just makes them less fit individually for their environment, more prone to predation and other effects that come from having a gigantic thing on your butt. Looking at the peacocks, we can see that the peahen, or the female of the species, is nowhere near as ornately decorated as the males are. This is a classic indicator that sexual selection is at work. Even though the male peacock is at a disadvantage for having this ornate tail feather arrangement, the fact that females prefer to mate with males with ornate and elaborate tails means that sexual selection will drive the evolution of really elaborate tails in peacocks because having an elaborate tail allows the male to survive. In some ways, you can think about sexual selection as driving the evolution of advertisements of fitness. It's a way of indicating to members of the opposite sex that even though you have this big elaborate structure on you, you still are able to survive, which is a way of demonstrating that your genes are very well adapted for your environment. In other words, sexual selection is favoring the traits that get you mates. We can see a really extreme example in praying mantises. During reproduction in praying mantises, the female will frequently eat the male starting at the head and working her way down. This is perhaps the most supremely maladaptive trait that you could think of evolving in a particular individual. But of course, since the reproductive act is a requirement for male praying mantises to reproduce, this trait has evolved over time in mantises and in a few other insect species as well. This trait is really beneficial to the offspring of the male praying mantis since giving the female a meal right after reproduction helps to ensure the success of her egg laying. But still, it's a pretty crazy example. Natural selection and sexual selection have been non-random processes. There are also some random processes that drive the evolution of a population. Random, not adaptive change is referred to as genetic drift in a population. This is just random changes in the gene pool due to chance events. Our mascot for genetic drift is the elephant seal, a population of organisms that were hunted almost to extinction until they were legally protected from further hunting. 
This type of genetic drift is often referred to as a bottleneck event. Something occurs in the population that greatly and randomly reduces the number of individuals in that population. Often this will drive the population to extinction. But if the population recovers from the bottleneck, the population that descends from the survivors will frequently have allele frequencies that are very, very different from the allele frequencies of the population that existed before the bottleneck. Let's take a look at how genetic drift works by going back to our hypothetical smiley population with their eye color trait. Just as a reminder, the big B allele codes for brown eyes and the little B allele codes for blue eyes. Here's a population of smileys and you can see the initial allele frequencies above me. We're going to subject our population to genetic drift. Some random number of individuals are going to be removed from the population. For the sake of argument, let's say that a freakish golf ball sized hailstorm killed off 10 of them randomly. As a result, their gene pool has changed. It has absolutely been reduced, but since it's been reduced, the frequencies of the alleles have changed, and each individual is now contributing more to the overall percentages of alleles in their gene pool. As a result, smaller populations of organisms tend to experience stronger genetic drift than larger populations do. These graphs are showing computer simulations of three different populations, each one 10 times larger than the population that came before it. Generations are being graphed on the x-axis and the frequency of different alleles is on the y-axis. Individual alleles are shown with different colored lines. You can see that the fluctuations in our smaller population are much greater than the fluctuations in our largest population. And in fact, we can see in our smaller population that some alleles are lost entirely, their frequency goes to zero, and other alleles become fixed in the entire population, meaning every individual in the population has the same allele, the frequency becomes 1.0. This is one of the hallmarks of genetic drift. Smaller populations drift more than larger populations do because each individual in the smaller population contributes to a larger percentage of the alleles in the gene pool than each individual in a larger population does. You should understand the mechanics of genetic drift more broadly, but there are also two specific drift situations that we should focus on. The first is our bottleneck effect, what we saw with our elephant seals from hunters or in our smileys from the golf ball sized hailstones, right? In the bottleneck effect, you can think about things like comets or so forth, randomly taking out some large number of individuals, reducing the overall population, and then that rebounding post bottleneck population having different allele frequencies than the population that existed before the bottleneck. The second specific genetic drift situation that you should be familiar with is the founder effect. And for that, I'd like you to think about the Amish. The Amish population has higher allele frequencies for several different traits than other human populations do. To spotlight one example, the rate of polydactyly or extra fingers on the hand is several times higher in the Amish population than it is in other human populations. Let's see if we can model how the founder effect works in our smiley population. The founders in the founder effect refer to a small subset of the individuals from a larger ancestral population. In this case, it's going to be these three blue-eyed smileys. They're going to be separated from the rest of the population, not because the rest of the population was randomly killed off, like in a bottleneck, but because some event has happened that has isolated these individuals from the rest of the population. Perhaps they have been shipwrecked on an island, or perhaps they've decided to start a religious movement where they reproductively only breed with other members of the same religious movement. For whatever reason, this subpopulation is going to found a new population of these organisms. But look at the gene pool of the ancestral population. The frequency of the big B allele for brown eyes is 0.375, and the frequency of the little B allele for blue eyes is 0.625 our founding members of our new population only have blue eyes. As a result, the frequency of the alleles in our new population changes dramatically. The brown eye allele is totally lost and the blue eye allele is now completely fixed. As a result, when our founding population gives rise to a new population, that new population is going to have a wildly different allele frequency for eye color than our ancestral population that our founders came from did. This is the founder effect. Again, it is not driving the adaptation of the population. It is simply a random function of the allele frequencies that were present in our founders, which is why it is an example of genetic drift. The last evolutionary force that we're going to look at here is gene flow, which is an evolutionary force that equalizes the allele frequencies between two different populations. A great example of gene flow that we can point to are the equalization of allele frequencies that we see in the modern human population as historically isolated groups have no longer been isolated from each other and, and as a result have been able to interact with and reproduce with each other. That of course is the case with these two individuals who had a child who you may in fact recognize. This is this idea of gene flow. 
As individuals from different populations come into contact with each other, they bring their alleles along for the ride. The result of this is complex, but generally speaking, we can say that it will tend to have an equalizing effect on any differences in allele frequencies we see between any two populations. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of evolutionary forces. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can compare and contrast the four different types of evolutionary forces. Also make sure that you can explain the effects of each evolutionary force on the gene pool and phenotypes that we would see in any population that's subjected to that force. If you can do those, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.